Gary Ginsburg grew up in Buffalo, New York, home to two US presidents. A lawyer by training, he has spent his professional career at the intersection of media, politics, and law. He worked for the Clinton administration, was a senior editor and counsel at political magazine George, and then spent the next two decades in executive positions in media and technology at News Corporation, Time Warner, and SoftBank. He has published pieces in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and was an on-air political contributor in the early days of MSNBC. First Friends is his first book. The book was published this summer and was a New York Times bestselling book and a USA Today Best Books of 2021 pick. Congratulations, Gary. Tonight, Gary is joined in conversation with Steve Edwards. Steve Edwards spent more than 20 years as an award-winning journalist, interviewer and host of such acclaimed programs as WBEZ's 848 and the Afternoon Shift. He has worked on the BBC. His work has appeared on the BBC, Bloomberg News, PBS, and numerous public radio stations around the United States. Most recently, he was Chief Content Officer and Interim CEO of WBEZ Chicago Public Media, Chicago's NPR news station. And from 2012 to 2017, he helped launch and lead the University of Chicago's Institute of Politics, a nonpartisan program devoted to cultivating the next generation of public service leaders. He's currently a managing director at Koya Partners, an executive search and strategic advisory firm focused on identifying and strengthening mission driven leaders across the civic and nonprofit sectors. Welcome to you both, and thanks for joining us tonight. Beth, thank you so much for that introduction. And Gary, thank you so much for making time for this conversation, which I'm so looking forward to. It's great to have you virtually across the state of Illinois tonight. Well, thank you, Steve. And thank you to the libraries for, for having me tonight. I'm delighted and honored to be a part of this tonight. And you know, just to underscore something that Beth said uh, for all of you who are joining us tonight, we will take your questions. We very much want your participation in this virtually. So as a reminder, in the chat queue on Zoom, you can type your questions in and you can type them as we're talking and then Heather will help us sort through them a bit later and we'll be sure to get to your questions as many as we possibly can later this evening. Um, but Gary, I, I have to say reading this book was absolutely fascinating. It also was fun in unexpected ways because I felt like I was getting a new window into presidents that I may have observed or read about historically. What was it that inspired you to take a look at presidencies through the prism of friendships as opposed to advisors or spouses or anything other relationship-wise for that matter? Well, I think the, uh, you, I, I, first of all, I came upon this idea really just, I woke up in the middle of the night with an idea of why don't you write a book about first friends of US presidents? And people have asked me, what was the, the immediate impetus? And I think it was really an accumulation of experiences that I had really since I was in the third grade growing up outside of Buffalo, New York and being just transfixed by the assassination of Abraham Lincoln as a third grade student watching the sixth grade stage a play about his assassination. And as I grew older, I witnessed the impact of first friends on both political candidates like Gary Hart during the 1984 campaign, and then the first friendship between Vernon Jordan and Bill Clinton. And then in, I think, uh, 2018, I was certainly taking note of the fact that it didn't seem to me that Donald Trump had a first friend and the impact that that may or may not have had on the arc of his presidency. And so I came upon this idea, um, and the reason why I wrote about first friends as opposed to first wives or first chefs or first butlers or first decorators is because those books have all been written before. But to my astonishment and to my, my pleasant surprise, there's never been a book about the role of first friends in US history viewed through the prism of the presidency itself. Uh, there have been books about all those other people who are in and around the president's orbit, but never about the first friend. And I thought that there were enough good stories that would illuminate the impact that this unsung, unknown role has had on both the president and the presidency. And so uh, I was fortunate to have the time uh, to write it and I'm delighted I did. 
Yeah. Um, so many questions to pick up on. Let me stay with just the thematic one before we get into some of these friendships. And that is just what can we learn? What do we learn about a president personally, politically, otherwise, through the prism of analyzing their friendship with, with a very close friend or confidant? Well, I think you learn a couple of things. One is, um, and people have always asked me, what is the thesis of your book? And I don't think there was a specific thesis. I think what I discovered in the three years from the moment I came up with this idea to when it was published was that those presidents who did have a best friend were typically better for it, and so was our country. Now, that's not to say that presidents who lacked a first friend or lacked any friendship at all necessarily were failures, or that those who had a lot of first friends or one very good friend would it ensure success? I think the election of 2000, when George Bush, a man of many, many close friendships, uh, was elected as opposed to Al Gore, who really lacked any close friends, and I write about that in my preface. The fact that Bush, Bush's presidency was not a success, I think somewhat reinforces that conclusion that I drew. But I think the overall conclusion that one can draw from my book is that just like presidents, we all benefit from having close friendships in our lives. We all benefit from having people that we implicitly trust, who have our back, who know us from our earliest days when we weren't what we are today, and can read our emotions, can read our moods, can speak to us in blunt terms and tell us what's really what we need to hear, but also can provide us respite and emotional support and a helping shoulder when we need that comfort. And so presidents are no different than the rest of us. And as I hopefully show in the nine stories I tell of first friendships, presidents have benefited both on a substantive level from having first friends, as well as on an intensely personal and emotional level from that friendship. You, uh, there are actually 10 presidents in this book of nine friendships. That's in part because the first relationship you write about is the one between Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, of course, both of whom were presidents. Um, what was it that struck you about the nature of their friendship uh, that, that endures and stands out to you? Well, I knew that they had enjoyed a, a very close collaboration. What I didn't appreciate until I delved into their, their relationship was the deep friendship that existed over the course of 50 years from April of 1776 until July 4th, 1826, when Thomas Jefferson dies. And in that 50 years, we experienced the depth of their friendship through 1,250 letters that were exchanged between them. It's an extraordinary uh, volume of correspondence, some as long as 17 pages, when uh, Madison writes to Jefferson to outline what he had just accomplished in Philadelphia writing the Constitution and some very short, you know, pithy exchanges of ideas and, and thoughts. But what, what struck me was how consequential the friendship was for our country and for our history. And I don't think it's an overstatement to say that as a result of their friendship, some of the core structures of our democracy came as a result, whether it was the Constitution whether it was the Bill of Rights, whether it was the two-party system that they kind of single-handedly developed on a trip that they took into upstate New York in 1791. The geographic contours of our country were forged as a result of their friendship. And not to mention the state university system that so many of us have enjoyed. It was a really a function of their post-presidential friendship between 1819 and 1826 when the two of them worked jointly together to develop the University of Virginia. So, so many things came out of it. And what struck me was just how different the two of them were, temperamentally, physically, um, how they looked at the world, but yet it was a friendship that just worked on a deeply personal level, as well as on a substantive level. Yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, you write about Madison as this um, diminutive person in, in stature, not somebody with, 
uh, a great intellect, but not somebody with a lot of great self-confidence early on, really looks up to Jefferson, lionizes him. There's a gap in aid. Yeah. Right. And and finds himself actually becoming not only a deep friend, but but a key advisor and somebody who ends up in many respects helping to further the legacy of Jefferson. It was something that I, I noticed through a lot of these relationships that the first friends in many cases become carriers of that that president's story and their history and their narrative in some way, some more successful yes. than others. Um, what what yeah. else strikes you about that? Well, I'll, I'll tell you a couple of things. Um, you know, when they meet in 1776, it's April. Jefferson is two months from penning the most famous document in American history. Madison is a 25 year old, five foot four, very sickly young man who just by, you know, he gets elected into this Virginia House of Delegates. He doesn't utter a word. He's just in awe of some of the people that he is sitting, sitting with. Jefferson doesn't even take note of him. Jefferson only takes note of him later when he served, when Madison serves on the Council of Advisors to the governor. By this point, Jefferson is Virginia's governor. But Jefferson immediately recognizes the genius behind this quiet, diminutive man. And I wouldn't just say that Madison advised uh, that Madison advised Jefferson. I would say that Madison really was the key force that kept Jefferson even in the political game when he oftentimes wanted to just retire to Monticello and live the life of a, of a farmer slash philosopher slash inventor. Um, you know, in 1782, Jefferson is just fed up with politics. He had almost been, he'd literally been drummed out of Richmond by the British he escapes. Uh, he's viewed as somebody who basically uh, abdicated his responsibilities as governor. They put him on a, in a sense on trial and he, he's vindicated, but yet he's so demoralized by that experience. And he's also sad in, in, in depression because of the death of his wife that he says to Madison, I'm quitting, I'm done. And it was only Madison's intervention with the Confederate Congress in 1782 to get him that posting in Paris, do we have Jefferson staying involved throughout the period of the writing of the constitution and then ultimately coming back in 1789 to, to become Washington's secretary of state. And I think, but for Madison, we probably would have lost Jefferson to history. You know, in telling that story, Gary, it reminds me of the relationship that you write about between Abraham Lincoln and his dear friend, Joshua Speed, who at another point in his life, in Abraham Lincoln's life, is really performing a similar role, um, counseling him, trying to get him, his spirits lifted, and him back into the just the swing of things as a person. Okay. I want you to tell that story, but before you do, um, who is Joshua Speed? Tell us more about him. Joshua Speed uh, grew up in Kentucky, son of wealthy plantation, plantation owner. Um, he goes to Springfield, starts a, a store with his cousin. Uh, it's a dry goods store. And he is tending to his store one day when a beanpole of a man, Abraham Lincoln, who's just moving to Springfield to start up his law practice, shows up and says, I need betting. And Speed says, well, it's, it'll be $17. And Lincoln says, well, I don't have $17. Now Speed, I think, knew exactly who Abraham Lincoln was. He was already in the Illinois legislature. He was already making a name for himself. And Speed was a pretty cunning, canny guy who also had some political aspirations of his own. So he says to Lincoln, he probably wouldn't have said this to too many other complete strangers who walk into his store. He says, well, go upstairs. I have a double bed if you like it you can share it with me. So Lincoln walks up the staircase. He looks at the double bed. He plops his stuff on the bed, walks back downstairs and says to Speed, Speed, I moved. And for <laughs> the next four years, they share that double bed. Now, historians and others have tried to determine what the nature of that relationship exactly was. Was it sexual? Was it not sexual? It's still, I guess, an open question. I think it's been pretty much resolved because of the lack of any concrete evidence that they were in any way uh, lovers, that it was a completely uh, you know, asexual friendship, but one that was deeply, deeply intimate in an emotional sense, in the sense of sharing their biggest fears, fears of consummating relationships with their fiancés or newly minted wives, 
They shared all of their waking hours together, all of their meals together, all of their aspirations. Um, and so it was, a, it was a unique friendship for Abraham Lincoln, who didn't have a lot of friends by that point in his life. You know, he'd grown up in a pretty solitary uh, family life in Kentucky and then in Illinois. So for him, Joshua Speed was his first most enduring, most meaningful friendship. You know, in the, the moment, there were several throughout each of their lives when uh, their friendship is really paramount in trying to really resuscitate the hopes and dreams and in some cases, um, emotional states of the other. One that you write about, and I don't want you to give too much away, but was a point where actually I, I, I didn't realize this to the degree in which you write about it was um, the degree to which Speed was instrumental in, in, and worried about um, Lincoln's depressive state to such a degree they worried about suicide. Um, yeah, I, yes. online. Abraham, just going back to your earlier point, Abraham Lincoln was in fact suicidal in January of 1841. He had proposed to Mary Todd and then had second thoughts and pulled it back. And at that very moment, Joshua Speed announces to Abraham Lincoln that after four years, he's moving back to Kentucky. He has to tend to the family estate. And those twin events sent Lincoln into such a spiral that he took to his bed and had protested that he really didn't want to live anymore. And so Speed, being his closest friend, took away all of his sharp objects. Uh, and in fact, at one point, Lincoln says, you know, if I die while I'm in this bed, no one will ever know the name Abraham Lincoln. Speed made sure during that month, and he ministered to him day and night, that the world would eventually know who, the, who Abraham Lincoln was. And that's why it is so profound that Joshua's, that that friendship formed when it did, because Lincoln was prone to depression. He had fallen into a deep depression in 1835 over, a, over a, an engagement he had with a woman who died. And it was a similar kind of experience where he was just utterly lost to his own depression. Speed was so close and he was so trusted that he was able to pull himself, pull Lincoln out of that depression and get him back on his feet. And by 1842, you know, they, they're able to live apart. Speed then does go to Kentucky and, you know, they don't really come back together again until 1861. You know, um, speaking of intimacy and the kind of confidence that you um, share that each of these individuals had with each other in terms of um, trusted friendships brings to mind um, the only woman you write about in the friendships of these presidents, and that's um, Daisy Sookley, who you say was FDR's most trusted confidant. Their relationship had elements of flirtation, but not romance. So tell us about that relationship yeah. and why she was so trusted. Yeah, there's actually three uh, of the nine relationships that I write about in my book, three have the potential for being sexual relationships. And I conclude that, that two of the three probably weren't of the third, the third being Daisy Sookley and FDR. I think there was a brief um, moment of romance and it occurs in 1935 on a treetop when I believe they kissed. I don't believe it was anything more than that. I have checked with the foremost authority on this Sookley FDR relationship, a historian named Jeffrey Ward. And I had a long conversation with him and he believes both that Daisy Sookley never had a sexual relationship in her life or a consummated sexual relationship and that FDR after he contracted polio was not able to have um, sexual intercourse. So I believe it was a kiss. I think it's validated by the diary entries that I write extensively about and include in my chapter. Daisy Sookley was to answer your immediate question, his sixth cousin, um, somebody who lived a pretty quiet, uh, sheltered life. FDR uh, brought her from her own self-described world of grayness into a world of vivid color by giving her a front row seat to his presidency, beginning with an invitation to his inauguration in 1933. But really the last four years of his friendship, Daisy Sookley was the antidote to Franklin Roosevelt's intense loneliness in the White House. And I know that seems counterintuitive. He's fighting a war. He's fighting a depression, but I think the evidence shows that FDR at heart was a deeply lonely president. His wife was away 
for a good chunk of his presidency crusading for her causes. His children were either fighting a war or just weren't in Washington and around to give him that emotional support he needed. And so he said to Daisy Sipley one day, I'm either exhibit A or left entirely alone. He didn't want to be left entirely alone. He wanted to be with somebody that he trusted, whom he felt comfortable with, whom after a day of 22 separate meetings like he had in 1944, he'd want to have a one-on-one -on -one dinner with. I don't know about you, Steve, but I'd want to crawl in a hole after 22 meetings in a day. He wanted to have dinner with Daisy Sickley because she could intuit things that nobody else could about him. She read his moods. She was adoring. She was curious. They could share laughs together. That He could share his fears and frustrations. And they forged this, this intimate emotional relationship that I think was a hugely important ballast for him in the final years of his presidency. We've been talking um, both in the case of FDR and Lincoln about two friendships where the support was not exclusively but, but significantly emotional in nature. What role do these friendships and these friends in particular play in shaping the decisions and policies, domestic or foreign, that presidents uh, undoubtedly have to enact or deal with? Yeah, well, I think it varies, of course. Um, there are some friendships in my book where the friend plays a pivotal role in a very consequential historic moment. There are two that will come immediately to mind for anybody who's read my book. One is uh, Eddie Jacobson in 1948, who convinces Harry Truman to see a man named Chaim Weitzman who was waiting in New York. Harry Truman would not see him because he was frustrated with the whole issue of how to resolve the issue of Palestine after the, the Second World War when Jews needed a home and his own Secretary of State George Marshall did not want to give a home to the Jewish people. Uh, Jewish uh, advocates were pressuring Truman. He got very frustrated, threw up his arms, said, Jesus Christ, couldn't please the Jews when he was alive. How am I supposed to please them? He wouldn't see this celebrated British scientist and the world's most important Zionist leader at the time who could have convinced Harry Truman to recognize a Jewish state. Eddie flies halfway across the country, walks unannounced into the Oval Office, and in a very, very dramatic conversation, convinces Harry Truman to see Chaim Weitzman. And 11 minutes after the State of Israel was declared in Tel Aviv in May of 1948. Harry Truman was the first foreign leader to recognize the Jewish state. And it had enormous consequences for the alliance between the two countries and for the growth of Israel over the, the succeeding 73 years. And so um, that's one example where it was a friendship that was kind of required to break this log jam in Harry Truman's mind to get him to do what he knew he needed to do but didn't want to do. And there are other examples. It's, yeah, I, I write extensively about David Ormsby Gore's role in the Kennedy administration, and then I think Vernon Jordan's role in the Bill Clinton administration, where it was both substantive, but also uh, deeply emotional. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, tell me why um, you actually quote, quote Arthur Schlesinger um, in writing of, uh, about JFK, that he was Kennedy was somebody who had the gift of friendship. Um, so potentially lots of people you could have written about. Um, what made David Ormsby Gore stand out um, in particular? And I wanna talk a little bit about selection there. And I yeah. don't wanna lose some other things about Eddie Jacobson. So uh, yeah, also I, I truncated the story, but yeah. it's really, it's, it's a very dramatic moment in the Oval Office, which uh, I'm happy to, to recount in more detail. Um, and David Ormsby Gore, you're dead right. Uh, John Kennedy, was a man who had friends from every aspect of his life, from Choate, from Harvard, from the, from the Navy, from uh, growing up in Riverdale, from, from you know, his campaigns in 48, 50, 46, 52, 58. And I, I could have done the obvious choice of a Len Billings, who was his best friend from Choate. He was so close that he had his own room on the third floor of the White House and his own Secret Service code name. Or I could have done Ben Bradley, the celebrated executive editor of the Washington Post, who is, you know, out there as a great friend to Kennedy. Or I could have done Dave Powers, the old Irish Paul, who was by his side in Dallas when he was assassinated. But 
they have all been covered to various degrees. And I really wanted to find a new friend. And I went to Kennedy's daughter, Caroline, who's an old friend of mine. We went to law school together and her brother was a very good friend of mine uh, in college. And I said, I'm gonna, she knew I was writing the book. And I said, I'm gonna put it to you. Who do you think was your dad's best friend? And she said, I'm gonna give you a name you've probably never heard of. Or if you've heard of him, you're not really sure who he is. It's gonna take you about 48 hours to figure out the friendship. But when you do, you're gonna thank me for it. His name is David Ormsby Gore. Now I'd heard the name, I had a vague recollection that he was British, but that was pretty much it. So I just start delving into everything I can find. I go to the Kennedy Library. I find 14 hours of oral history that Len Billings gives. I find 77 pages, basically probably three hours of one transcript from David Ormsby Gore. And I'm like, is this really gonna be his closest friend? And then just digging, 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 I found the story. And I think it is, it is, she was dead right. David Ormsby Gore, in the last three years of Jack Kennedy's life, was both his most enjoyed friend on the golf course in Hyannis and Glenora at Camp David in the White House. His wife was his wife was a great friend of Jackie's and Jack's. They spent more time as a couple than any other couple during Kennedy's presidency. But just as importantly, he was Kennedy's most important foreign policy advisor, beginning with the 1960 campaign, and then in the White House, really beginning during the Cuban Missile Crisis on day six, and then running throughout the rest of Kennedy's presidency until he shot in November of 1963. David Ormsby Gore was probably the most influential voice helping guide John Kennedy through global crises. And, and Gary, we should point out that during this significant period that we're talking about here in the latter part of the Kennedy uh, term, Ormsby Gore is the U.S. or the U.K. ambassador to the United States. So he yeah. actually is yeah. representing a foreign power. It's not just a buddy you're having over. Um, no, it's exactly right. And they, they, meet, yeah, they meet in 1938 in pre-war London. They're both second sons of powerful fathers. They don't have any clue what to do with their, the fancy educations they're receiving, but they know they love to, to talk fast, to gossip, to go to the horse races, to play golf, to carouse, and they love to debate. They love to debate the nature of leadership in a democracy. And they forged this friendship in 1938, and it remained strong throughout the war. And then into the 1950s, when they each uh, rise in the respective government bureaucracies, Gormsby Gore gets elected to the British House of Commons, eventually gets appointed to the Ministry of State. And just at the time when Jack Kennedy is becoming a national candidate, Gormsby Gore is becoming a national foreign policy figure in the UK. He's probably the foremost expert in nuclear disarmament. And it's just a perfect confluence of moment, interest, and, um, and circumstance for their friendship to flower when Jack Kennedy becomes president. And as you say, in 1961, he's appointed the British ambassador to the United States. So he has the ability now to be read into important events and to act in an unofficial capacity to Jack Kennedy as he wrestles with these foreign policy uh, issues. Yeah, you know, um, I, I will leave it there because I don't want to give away more, but I will say to anybody who hasn't read the book and read this particular relationship um, in detail, it's it's really fascinating to get the to, to go inside the foreign policy conversations that that these two are having, particularly when you factor not just the friendship, but David Ormsby Gore as a diplomat from another country, albeit you know America's closest ally, has just a different way of seeing into the problems of the world and particularly during the Cold War in a way that um, uh, proved to be particularly insightful for Kennedy um, especially. I, I want to um, ask you kind of thinking about Jacobson for a second too, not to go back to that um, too much, but I, what's interesting about the Jacobson story above and beyond his influence in this major decision, um, really landmark decision um, in American history and, and the Truman presidency, is that Jacobson, in contrast to Arms v. Gore, wasn't a foreign policy expert, an international diplomat, or even a 
you know, a, a, a major national figure. They, he was a, a Kansas Cityan. Um, he was the, the son uh, of, of poor Jewish immigrants from Lithuania. Um, and um, their friendship, you know, had moments of uh, not estrangement at all, but but being closer in proximity than than others, but but enduring over time. Um, one of the things that that is is striking in thinking about Truman is the fact that he has, by his own admission, the closest relationship, closest friendship of his life with Eddie Jacobson, enduring for decades, and yet Truman himself, um, in word and in letter, is seen time and again. Um, perpetuating stereotypes of the day um, as it relates to uh, Jews, as it relates to African-Americans and others. Um, how do you square that? Yeah, and I, and I address that in the chapter because it, it, the question is begged by the fact that he takes this important step in recognizing the state of Israel, which he described as the proudest moment of his presidency, ironically, he describes that later after he's left the White House. Yet he was a man who grew up uh, in his in-laws home where the where Jewish people were not allowed inside the home. They were allowed on the porch, but never allowed inside. He was a man who, as you say, referred to Jews in derogatory terms from time to time. He even referred to Eddie, who helped him build a successful canteen in his field artillery unit. He called him his Cracker Jack Jew. Um, but I think that Harry Truman at heart believed deeply in the need for a Jewish state. He had supported the resettlement of Jewish refugees after the Holocaust in 1945. He was a man of the Bible who appreciated the covenant that existed between the Jewish people and God and the role that the land of Israel played for the Jewish people, certainly in biblical times. So I think that he was, he was a product of his times, as you said in your lead up. Um, he did not shy away from the the odd, you know, crack about kikes or Jews, what, you know, terms that obviously were derogatory. But I think when it came time to do the right thing, he recognized what he had to do and he did the right thing. And I think what's interesting about Eddie is that he had never asked for anything from Harry Truman up to that point. And when he walks into the Oval Office, they make chit chat. He Truman knows that he's flown halfway across the country and he's not set up this meeting in advance. And he says, well, what are you doing here? Because you've never asked for anything before. But this was an issue that really mattered to Eddie Jacobson. He had kind of come late to the cause, but beginning in 1945, he had been lobbied by Zionists who understood his friendship and he had taken a real interest in it. He had gone to Washington a couple of times in 46 and 47 to talk to Truman about this issue but not really to actively lobby, but to just impart his own views about it. But this was really a, a, a very unique moment in their 45 year friendship up to that point where he said, listen to me, Harry, you have to do this. And you have to do this because your hero is Andrew Jackson. He looked at a statue of him in the Oval Office and said, what would Andrew Jackson do in this moment? Would he be cowed by quote, the sissies who are perturbing you who are frustrating you, or would he be able to overcome that and do what he knows is right, which is to recognize a Jewish state, and in this case, to see Chaim Weitzman, whom you respect and whom you owe a meeting to. And so it only, I think, Eddie Jacobson in that 45-year friendship could have appealed to him um, using the history of their friendship and using emotional language that he knew would resonate with him. Could he break this log jam that had existed in Truman's mind now for many months to get him to do what he knew he needed to do, which is recognize the state. Yeah, it's a it's a really powerful um, scene in your book. I I, I want to just remind folks we're going to take your questions. I know some folks have been writing in on the chat, which is great. Uh, we're going to move to your questions here in just a few minutes. But um, as we make that transition, Gary, there's so many other aspects of these relationships we've already talked about, not to mention the others that you highlight in the book, including relationships like Franklin Pierce and the famous author Nathaniel Hawthorne and mm -hmm. more recent relationships you referred to, Bill Clinton and Vernon Jordan um, and points between. But I, I want to go back to your experiences working on presidential campaigns and administrations. Um, what does the act of being in politics and particularly seeking the highest office in the land 
due to the candidate's sense of trust and friendship and who can be in and out of the inner circle and what people want from this person? How does it, how does it change dynamics that way? Well, I think a couple of things. One, I think when the, you become president, um, it can be an intensely lonely job. Uh, I've mentioned it in the context of Franklin Roosevelt. I talked to Hillary Clinton about the role of friendship to her husband, Bill Clinton, and she said he needed his close friends for respite because of the pressures of the job. I don't think Bill Clinton ever experienced loneliness. He was just too gregarious uh, a man and so extroverted that I don't think he was capable of being lonely, but he was a man who, who got very stressed, as it turns out, and needed to be away from the office with people he just trusted implicitly so that he could just let his hair down. He could say what he wanted to say. He could feel at peace. Um, and so I think the presidency kind of demands that a president have people around him who don't necessarily just serve at his pleasure, whose jobs aren't dependent on him or her. And that's really the role that friends play that, are, that is differentiated from close staff. Because at the end of the day, you're still staff. And at the end of the day, there's a limit to how much you can truly speak your mind to, a, to your boss. And at a certain point, you have to just say, okay, sir, it's your decision. I disagree, but I'm going to leave it. For a friend, you can just go to the mat because you've built up so much trust in your relationship that there's really no artificial limit to it. And I think you see that with Eddie Jacobson. Very few people would have spoken to Truman in the terms that he did. And I think you see that with Vernon Jordan and, and Bill Clinton. I think you see that with Joshua Speed and Lincoln, actually. I mean, I think that they had developed such a bond in those four years that Speed could just say to, to, to Lincoln, no, I'm, I'm too rich to join your administration. I'm not going to do it, but I'm going to help you in Kentucky, and I'm going to keep them from seceding. I'll do everything I can, but I ain't joining your government. Very few people would say that to the president. Vernon said the same thing to Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton was desperate to have Vernon as his attorney general. Vernon said, I could be more useful to you as your first friend. And he was, because of that lack of that, that lack of that that employee-employer relationship. And, um, and I think that for candidates, I saw it with Gary Hart. He didn't know what had happened to him when he won the primary in 1984 in New Hampshire. And he's trying to figure out how do I deal with the fame and the huge crowds that I have now before me? And who does he turn to but Warren Beatty? I know he was a very lucky man because his best friend happened to be the most celebrated Hollywood actor at that time. And so Warren Beatty flies in. Now he's a guy who knows stagecraft, right? Gary Hart's just a kind of quirky senator from Colorado who's now a national figure. And Warren Beatty says to Hart, stop talking and acting like a politician, Gary. You gotta be yourself. I gotta teach you how to act as, a, as essentially as a star. And I'd watch the two of them interact in these meetings. It was fascinating because he was the only one around Cart, who could speak to him like that. But then at the same time, he would take him out for dinner and they would yuck it up in a way that he just wasn't gonna do with anybody else who was on his staff. It just wasn't his nature, but he gave him that ability to just kind of relax when he was off the camera. It was hugely important to him. I mean, he didn't win the nomination, but that's when I really first saw the important role of a first friend, albeit with a candidate, not a president. We've uh, alluded to the fact that there are nine relationships you profile in first friends, um, but we've had 46 presidents. So how did you choose which relationships to highlight out of potentially, you know, many, many more possibilities? Yeah. Well, I, in a kind of a perverse sense, I wanted to try to find Donald Trump's first friend. And um, I found somebody quite close to the the Trump presidency. And we went back and forth on various ideas of first friends to, to, um, to spotlight. And uh, this person eventually just kind of went AWOL on me. And then we spoke about a month after I handed in the manuscript, which was a month after Trump left office. And this person said to me, the truth was, Gary, I, I couldn't give you a, a name because he doesn't have a first friend. He's 
constitutionally incapable of having a first friend. He's too independent. His first friend really is the adoration of the masses. And so, you know, I would have liked to have done a Trump first friendship if I could have found him one, but as I concluded, there wasn't one. Um, I knew I wanted to do Clinton Jordan, as I told you. Um, I, um, I, there were a few that I really did struggle with whether I wanted to spend that much time with. Grover Cleveland had a very odd first friend, but it had a sordid twist to it. And I didn't think it illuminated some of the values that I wanted in a first friendship. Um, I looked at Warren Harding. His first friend was a, was a German, was a girlfriend while he was married, who happened to be a German spy at the very moment he had to decide whether to declare a war in 1917, and he had to choose between his patriotism and his lust. And unfortunately, he chose his patriotism. Um, but the friendships I chose, I really chose because I wanted to cover the span of the of US history from its founding until the present time. I would have liked to have done Obama, to be completely honest. I talked to his first friend, Marty Nesbitt. He was thrilled when I called. He said, I've been dying to tell the story of my friendship. He then spoke to Obama. This was in July of 2019, and Obama just didn't want to do it. He was writing his own memoir. He was deep in the process. I don't think he wanted to take the time mm -hmm. to talk to me for a book that he wasn't going to benefit from in any way. It's too bad because I think there's a good friendship there. And I would have loved to have done Joe Biden's first friendship with Ted Kaufman, but he was elected after I handed it in. Um, there's a question actually I saw pop up in the chat about Biden's first friendship. So maybe we'll turn to that. And let me bring in um, Heather Ross of the Evanston Public Library as we turn to questions. So Heather, I don't know what you have for us, but um, uh, we welcome the questions that have come in and, and more that may be coming yet. Okay, great. Thank you so much for this absolutely fascinating conversation. Um, before the questions, there's going to be just this poll that's going to pop up if you can if you could please just answer for a second um, and then we'll get right to your questions we'd, we'd greatly appreciate it. Um, so the so just to uh, to go off what you were saying um, Jacqueline writes who is Biden's best friend, um, you did say Ted Kaufman, but maybe you have some like a story that you could share with us about that. Yeah. Well, um, I knew I was going to get asked this question once the book was published. So I sought out, uh, I asked dozens of people, everybody to a person said it was Ted Kaufman. So I did a little research on Ted Kaufman, the best thing uh, in kind of his pre-vice presidential life to source was What It Takes by Richard Ben Kramer, where Ted Kaufman appears at all the pivotal moments. But Ted Kaufman was... Joe Biden's chief of staff for 22 years, when the average length of a chief of staff today is three years. But he wasn't only his chief of staff, he was also his best friend. And it was reinforced by the fact that they took the train back and forth between Wilmington and, and Washington every day that he served in the Senate. And they forged a deep, deep friendship. And I'll give you just one example of it. In 2015, when Bo when Bo Biden was dying, we all know how close uh, the then vice president was to his son. And he realized that he did not want to experience his death alone in Washington. He needed his best friend by him. So he calls Ted up and he says, will you accept a 120 day special government employee designation and just come down and get an office in the executive office building and just be around me? because I don't want to suffer this alone. And so Ted, without another word, packs his bags, moves down to Washington, takes an office in the EOB, and just sits in the office with no other responsibility other than to provide comfort to his best friend. And Bo dies the next month. He stays the entire four months. They see each other constantly. And I think he provided him with really crucial emotional support in a wrenching, searing time in Joe Biden's life. And I think that that's played out throughout their friendship and association since 1972 when they first met. Um, okay, we're gonna, a whole bunch of questions came in as, as you were talking. Um, were there any presidents whose wife was their best friend? Yes, many. Um, and I, you know, listen, I, 
it could, I could have included First Wives, but I made the determination, first of all, that First Wives have been written about extensively. And I think that there's just a different type of friendship that exists between a family member and a non-family member, um, a staffer or a non-staffer. As I talked at some length already with Steve about the distinction between a friend and a staffer, and I think the same exists between a wife and a friendship. So I didn't, I didn't do first wives, but certainly Rosalind Carter was Jimmy Carter's best friend. There's no question that Nancy Reagan was Ronald Reagan's first friend. I mean, a lot of people said, why didn't you do Ronald Reagan? The reality is, to the extent that Reagan had any friends, they were all derivative of Nancy's friendships with her best female friends. And their friendship was extraordinary. I mean, I think the same is true, um, as I said, for Jimmy Carter. If you ask him who his best friend was, no question he would say Rosalind. Okay, great. Um, that makes a lot of sense. There's just a comment, Brenda, a brilliant interview, thank you. Um, Another question, uh, Robert asked, did you find evidence of playful humor in these relationships, particularly Jefferson, Madison, and Lincoln Speed? Humor, that's an interesting, that's I've never playful been asked that question. <laughs> um, I think the, the, the example where there was the greatest humor was I think Jordan and Clinton. Um, I can't include some of the jokes that I heard, they were, you know, they really weren't fit for a book that I hope will be read by all family members, um, but they enjoyed a really playful repartee. Um, and they they were both, I mean, in particular, Vernon, a very funny man, very quick-witted. Um, I'm, I'm told that Rebozo had great stories and a lot of quips with Richard Nixon. And what was so interesting about that friendship was that Richard Nixon was a dark, brooding man deeply intellectual and he chose as his best friend, a high school graduate whose first job was as a Pan Am steward. They couldn't, just like I talked about with um, Jefferson and Madison, these two were complete opposites. And yet Nixon had the self-awareness to know that he couldn't just be alone with his yellow legal pad. He needed a first friend. And so he chose a man who could sit with him for hours in silence, but know when just the right moment to interject with a joke or a quip or an anecdote or a mix a martini or a cook a Cuban steak to take him out of his brooding and bring him back into life. Because without it, I think Dick Nixon would have been an even darker president and a darker senator and vice president than he was. And it, that's where you see the value of a fr first friendship in its most intimate sense of kind of pulling him out of his daily depressions and his daily broodings. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, so sorry, I'm, I need reading glasses, so I'm leaning in. Um, <laughs> here's one. Um, were there presidents embroiled, embroiled in scandal who revealed the truth to their best friends, even while withholding it from the public? If so, who and what? I'm not sure if you would know the answer to that. <laughs> but... well, yeah, I mean, well, I, if then just go back and go back to Nixon Rebozo. Um, Dick Nixon involved B.B. Rebozo in all of his scheming. As soon as he becomes president in 1969, he decides he wants to raise campaign funds off the books. And the first person he thinks of to help him in this is B.B. Rebozo. Now, B.B. Rebozo in 1967 was one of the few people around Nixon to say, don't run for president. And he was very, very honest with Nixon, even though he knew how beneficial it would be to his own life to have his best friend as president. And that's because he saw the emotional toll that losing in 1960 and 62 had taken on his wife and his daughters. He was very close to the daughters. So he says to Nixon, don't do it. Nixon obviously ends up running for president. He wins. But as soon as he becomes president, he's insecure. And he feels like he has to do everything he can to undermine his perceived enemies. And the person he enlists first and foremost, as I just said, was Bibi Rebozo. Now, this was a moment for B.B. Rebozo to do what he did in 67 and to stand up to him and say, no, Mr. President, Dick, you don't need to do these things. You don't need to undermine your rivals. You're secure. You just want, an, you just want a you know, close election, but you're president of the United States, for God's sake. Why do you need to do these nefarious acts? But he didn't. And he takes a $100,000 bribe 
from Howard Hughes in 1970, which I write about later in my chapter, which I believe was the impetus for Dick Nixon bugging the DNC headquarters in 1972, which leads to his impeachment and ultimate resignation. So there's a case where Rebozo and Nixon are deeply engaged in really scandal from the get-go. And the two conspire ultimately to bring down Nixon's presidency. It's a crazy, it's a crazy tale. That is, that is. Um, let's see. Uh, there's so many. Oh, did any president break was the best friend? Yes. Okay. No, Very no, celebrated. No. It's one of the chapters we haven't discussed yet. And I won't, it's a long, long, complicated story, but I'll just give you the very broad contours. Woodrow Wilson's best friend was a guy named Colonel Edward House. They meet in 1911. By 1913, Edward House is the most powerful private citizen in the United States government. He is Woodrow Wilson's diplomat in chief. He's his personnel in chief. He is essentially running the CIA, the National Security Council, the Department of State, and is not accountable to anybody but his best friend, Woodrow Wilson. He runs foreign policy from 1913 right up until April of 1919, when Woodrow Wilson signs the Treaty of Versailles, officially ending the First World War. He goes to the train station in Paris with Edward House, and he basically says goodbye to him and never speaks to him again. Has a vicious break with his best friend. There's no question he's not only his closest counselor, but he's by far his best friend. Woodrow Wilson had had a best friend in 1906. He has a vicious break with his best friend, a member of the Princeton faculty. His daughter says the two greatest tragedies in my father's life was his break with his best friend in 1906 and the loss of the Treaty of the, the um, League of Nations Treaty. So he needs a first friend and he finds it in Edward House. But Wilson's second wife is very jealous of this friendship when she comes on the scene in 1915. And all she wants us to do is to get rid of this force in her hus new husband's life. And she spends four years undermining him. And she finally succeeds, as I say, on this very last day uh, during the, the, the Paris peace talks. And that is the end of the Colonel House friendship. He doesn't get invited to Wilson's funeral and he spends the last 20 years of his life trying to make sense of what went wrong in his friendship with Woodrow Wilson. Wow, it's um, the power of the wife. Yeah. Right? The power of the <laughs> and Heather, why don't we, uh, why don't we make this question uh, the last one? Before this will we be the last the one. I'm trying to, um, okay, I, I guess I'll just ask this one. This is the, oh. Um, I know you didn't want to include family members, but was JFK closer to RFK than David? Yeah, there's no question. I mean, they okay. had bond unlike any, any, any other probably sibling, sibling of a president in American history. But so much has been written about Bobby Kennedy. And I, as I said earlier, I didn't want to include family members. But sure, was yeah. Bobby Kennedy his closest friend? Yeah, but I would say Gore was pretty close. I mean, Bobby Kennedy grew very close to Ormsby Gore, and Ormsby Gore was a pallbearer at RFK's funeral. That's how close they became. So RFK recognized the extraordinary friendship his brother had and wanted to preserve it after Kennedy was gone from the earth and did. Yeah. Um, first of all, Heather, thank you so much. And, and the questions have been great. There are many others. Gary, now that you have pen this book. I'm very curious to know what's next for you. Uh, is there another book or more presidential history that's yet to be mine for you? Uh, I'm very tempted to do another book. Um, and I'm starting to think about new topics that hopefully haven't been mined before. I had the idea to write a book on chiefs of staff back in 2010. And I spent about a year doing research on it. I knew there was a book to be written. I just didn't have the time to do it. And of course, it was written Eventually, as you know, The Gatekeeper is a brilliant book by Whipple. Um, but I'm looking for something like that. And I've got one idea that I'm kind of playing with. I hope it pans out. And um, hopefully I'll be able to, to come up with another book that, uh, that seems to resonate. 
Well, this one is fascinating indeed. It's called First Friends, the Powerful, Unsung, and Unelected People Who Shaped Our Presidents. It's written by Gary Ginsburg. Gary, thanks so much for this. I'm going to turn things back over to Beth Keller to wrap us up, but such a pleasure to be in conversation with you. Thank you, Steve. Really enjoyed it. Gary and Steve, what a great conversation. Thank you both for joining us today and um, bringing all these stories to our varied communities across Illinois. I just want to remind everybody that First Friends can be purchased uh, from the four bookstores that are supporting our event, Bookends and Beginnings, Bookies, Prairie Facts Books, and The Bookstall. And you can find the links in the chat box. And um, there'll be signed book plates available while supplies last. So thank you all and uh, good night to everyone. Thank you. Thank you.